Blog Talk Radio. The Chamo Opera can you operate? I think the Nay Ojira da, the Dinde Ojira Ko, Quasi, Ran and Pita, Aka, Akamaman, Maruka, Tibu, Ojira Ko, Ojira Manu. Greetings to all Opera Kani, Opera Kani, people meaning Africans like people today. It's Ojira Day, Purification Day. My name is Ojira Ko, Quasi. Rana and Pata Akan. Ojira for the Akamu Nation in North America within Ojirama, the purified nation, Afurakani, Afurakani, people in the Western Hemisphere. Yet I say we thank you for tuning into the broadcast once again. We are um, opening up the chat room, and there's issues going on with the login, so. Give me one second. We might have to reboot real quick. Just give me one second and let me know if there's an issue. Let me know if you can hear me. Give me one second.
Fakanu upright high news Neye Ujira da Dinde Ujira for Quasi Rane Buta Akan Akwamuman Marukai Tibi Lu Ujira for Ujira Mai Lu. With it all Afrakani Afrakani people meaning Africans like people today. It's Ujira Day, Purification Day. My name is Ujira for Quasi Rane Buta Akan. Ojira for the Afrano Nation in North America was in Ojira Mind, the purified nation of Afrakani Afrakani people in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, we had a couple of technical issues, so those who are on the phone line, um, if you can hit the number one, let us know that you can hear clearly. And if you're in the chat room, when you log into the chat room, okay, issue with the uh, connect with law talk it was causing the problem. So we're going to have to pull up our information that we had up previously. Um, for those who are new to the broadcast, we have four broadcasts on a weekly basis. We have our Kanko Nana Song, Ancient Authentic Akan Ancestry Religion on Jodan Monday night, where we deal specifically with the Akan expression of Nana Song, of Apurakani Afrakani Ancestry Religion. The Akan expression, first and foremost, because we are Akan, secondly, because of the misinformation being propagated regarding Akan, cosmology, ancestry, religion, ritual practice, and so forth. So we deal specifically with the Akan expression, going back to our ancient ancestral roots and ancient Kana, which is a title of ancient Nubia. Our people originated in that region, migrated to the western part of the continent, after the fall of Kemet, reestablished the Kana Empire, the Khan or Akan Empire in the western part of the continent, the Empire of Ghana, about 2,000 years ago, about 1,000 years later, because of Muslim invasion, some of our people migrated further south towards the regions of today, Ghana and Ivory Coast, and reestablished Akana civilization in that region. Hundreds of years later, some of us were forced into the Western Hemisphere during the Muslim Kessia, the Great Diversity, the Enslavement Era. And this is how we ended up in North, Central, South America, the Caribbean, and Europe. But we maintained our and through religious practices as Akan people, thus the Akan tradition in South America, in Suriname is called Wingsi, in Jamaica it's called Obia, in North America, the Akan ancestral religion is called Pudu, from the Akan term Undu, which means medicine from roots, trees, plant life. It also means to become heavy with the spirit through Kanche, which is the Akan term, meaning to utter incantations to bring down the forces of nature, the Aposon, and the Usamapo, the ancestors and ancestors. That is the origin of the term Kanjur, as mispronounced in English, but it is the Akan term Kanche, a descriptive title of our ritual practice, our ancestral religion, and also Hindu, which is the term Hudu. So we maintained our tradition. It is through our ancestral religious traditions that we were empowered and guided to wage war against the whites and their offspring, forced them into enslavement and in the Western Hemisphere and reestablish ourselves. So this is what we deal with on Joda Monday night, Akanto Nanato. On Awukuda Wednesday nights, we have Egua Marketplace Day, where we showcase Afurakani Afurakani businesses, organizations, and institutions, those who have been serving the Afurakani Afurakani community in a positive capacity, those who also maintain their ancestral religious values in the process. Give me one second. We want to pull up this information real quick. If you have any questions or comments in the chat room, uh, simply hit the number one. Oh, I'm sorry, that's on the phone line. Hit the number one so that we can see that your hand is raised. If you have any questions or comments uh, in the chat room, you must log in as a user in order to interact in the chat room. So we're going to put some links in the chat room, and we're also going to, and we just have to pull this information back up because we lost the information when we had to reboot everything. So just give me one second. Um, but as we were saying, 
when the night of Wukuda Akwada showcased Afurakani Afurakani businesses, organizations, and institutions. Okom economic development model is a model of economic development rooted in our ancestral religious values. This means it's a holistic approach to economic development. Part of that process, you can download that Okom economic development model from our webpage, the Okom page, OKOM, on ongira.co.com. And you can download the four part series we did on the model, dissecting the model on Blog Talk. Part of that process is the strategy we use to starve the beast and feed the fry. That means on a weekly basis, you make a determination regarding what funds you would have potentially wasted with the whites and their offspring, and then you starve the beast and feed the fry. You redirect those funds away from the white businesses and direct them, reallocate them to the business organization or institution of the week. We're targeting one Afurakani Afurakani business organization or in per week for 52 weeks for optimal capital infusion. Thus, when we starve the beef and feed the pride, and you reallocate 10 or $15 away from the white business you would have potentially wasted it with during the course of the week and reallocate it to the black business organization or institution of the week, then that is a reallocation of 10 to $15. If a thousand people engage that process, we are reallocating or rerouting 10 or $15,000 from white businesses to a black business that will allow them in the course of seven days to hire within the community full-time employment for our people within the community, expand their product and service lines to us, and it's a win-win situation. If we do not engage that process, by default, we leave that ten to $15,000 in the hands of our absolute enemies. And once we leave that ten or $15,000 in the hands of our absolute enemies, by default, we are financing our own oppression. So we starve the beast and feed the pride on a weekly basis. This is what we deal with on Equa Marketplace. We have a list of individuals who have come onto the show, talk about their businesses, organizations, institutions, and we will be having more guests coming onto the show on a regular basis. On Yalda Thursday nights, we have Amain Stem, Affairs of the Nation. So we deal specifically with events, current events, issues that are taking place in the Afrakani, Afrakani community, the African black community, and how we approach them, obstacles or perceived obstacles from an Amanie perspective, a nationist perspective. As Ojiramai, the purified nation, Afrakani, Afrakani people in the Western Hemisphere, we deal with our approach to life which is Amanie nationism, which is the purification of nationalism. When we talk about nationism or Amanie, Omai means nation, Atie means things, objects, deeds, entities. Amanie means things of the nation, the manners of the nation, nationism. A nation in a real sense, when we're naturally drawn to a specific region of the earth mother, the Afurakani, Afurakani people, we're drawn together to coalesce, to blend ancestral blood circles, to facilitate the return of sisters and ancestors from our clan back into the world through these blended blood circles. Afurakani, Afurakani people only, of course, we're drawn to interface with a specific region of the Earth Mother as we have done in the Western region of the Earth Mother, interfacing with her, as well as a specific and unique manifestation of the Orisha, the Abosom, the divinity in this region of the Earth Mother and the blending of blood circles, we have forged a unique identity, a locative identity, a unique collective. A nation is an entity, a living, breathing entity, and we are component parts of that living, breathing entity, just like cells are a component part of an organ. And the organ is an entity in and of itself, and it has Abosom deities that govern it spirits that govern an actual nation in the real sense, a natural coalescing of Afurakani, Afurakani people, only, of course, blending blood circles in a certain region of the Earth Mother, Asase, therefore, we're governed by a specific force in creation. 
our nation is a living entity governed by specific Abosom, Orisha, Vodou, and so forth, and we are component parts of that. So when we recognize that fact, that structure, then we approach life in a nationist perspective, from a nationist footing, from that regard. So this is what we deal with on Yaoda on Thursday night with current events, what is the best means by which we need to move and address specific issues so we can overcome perceived obstacles as well as real obstacles as an Afurakani Afurakani community, as Ogiraman, the purified nation, Afurakani Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere. And tonight, Ojira, purification, the term purification, Ojira means purification in ancient Kamet and Kanat. It also means to celebrate the ceremony of purification. In the language of the Akan, Jira means purification. It also means to celebrate the ceremony of purification. Of course, it is the same word from ancient Kanat and Kamet, unbroken because we speak the same language. It is our ancestral language. When we deal with Ojira, we always say Ojira purification operationalizes Nanason. Purification operationalizes ancestral religion. Ancestral religion is the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual duration of divine vow. That means through ritual, we incorporate those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to incorporate in order to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order. And through ritual, we reject those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to reject in order to restore balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions, and thus realign ourselves with divine order. So the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance are the expansive and contractive poles of ancestral religion, no matter what form it takes amongst Afurakani, Afurakani people, wherever we exist in the world, including the Western Hemisphere, Kubi, which is the Akan tradition in North America, Juju, which is the Yoruba tradition in North America, Rigri, which is a Bambara tradition in North America, Vodou, which is a Fon and Epe tradition in North America, and so forth. Purification, Ojira, operationalizes Nanason. Purification operationalizes our practice of ritually incorporating divine law, ritually restoring divine balance, so that we can align every thought, every intention, and every action with divine order every moment of every day because that is the culture, the way of life of Afurakani, Afurakani people. We have a function to execute in creation, and as we execute our specific function in creation, just like every cell has a specific function to execute in the body, when it's a naturally formed cell, if it's a degenerate cancerous cell, it doesn't have a natural function, and this is why it's slated for destruction. But naturally occurring cells, have a specific function to execute within their organ, their gland, their system, and so forth. We ourselves within the great divine body of Aminet and Amen, Nyamewa and Nyame, the great mother and great father of the supreme being. We are cells within organs within the great divine body. We have specific functions to execute. As we execute our function, we seek to align every thought, every intention, every action, every moment of every day with divine order. Just like your cells function in harmony with divine order, every moment of every day. If we make some mistakes, then through ritual, we incorporate law, we learn what the law is, incorporate law, and through ritual, we restore balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions. Therefore, we can move forward in a harmonious fashion and get back on track. This is how ancestral religion impacts every aspect of our lives. As Akurakani, Akurakani people, and Afurakani, Afurakani people only. We live in creation, impacted just like we are impacted by the sun, the gravitational pull of the moon, the atmosphere, the rivers, oceans, earth mother, and so forth. We are totally dependent on these features of creation for our existence, our sustenance, our continuity. In the same fashion, our spirit bodies are impacted by the spiritual forces that animate the sun, animate the moon, animate the atmosphere within Earth, animate the Earth Mother, animate the oceans, rivers, and so forth. 
and our spirit bodies are dependent on the energy emanating from these forces in creation that animate the physical aspects of creation. We must live in harmony, not only physically with creation, but also with the spiritual forces that animate creation. These are the Abosoma, as they're called in Akan, the Bodu, as they're called in Ete and Fong, the Orisha, as they're called in the Yoruba tradition, the Arusi, as they're called in the Igbo tradition, and so forth. So this is what we deal with on Ojira, purification. We're talking about the purification of the culture. This is the third part of our series on the etymology and cosmology of the term conscious, as well as the deity, Etep, and the night dealing with the divinity, Etepet. So in the first two parts, we dealt with the etymology of the term. There are many individuals, many misinformed individuals as well as agents within our community who misinterpret the term conscious deliberately as well as through ignorance because they're agents of the white and their offspring interpret the term tete or hotep. The whites and their offspring saw the power of us returning to our ancestral religious practices, returning to our culture. When you return to your ancestral religious practices, including embracing your ancestral names and your ancestral culture and so forth, that means you realign yourself with your nanano insamanko, your aku, your akutu, your ancestors and ancestors of your direct blood circle who are spiritually cultured. You realign yourself with the abosa on the forces in nature that govern you. When you align with the forces in nature that govern you, that are connected to your blood circle, that are born into the world with you, and you realign with your nananom, insamampo, your spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors, you only seek guidance from these divine forces and ancestral entities. You do not seek guidance from our absolute enemies, the whites and their offspring. So they can't control you when you only take orders and seek guidance and direction from those who are connected to your direct ancestral spirit genetic blood cell. And when the Abosom direct you to execute and exterminate the white male spring, then you move forward and exterminate them. This is how the so-called maroon, the color wars and so forth, jumped off in North America. This is how the end of enslavement came forward in North America. We were guided by our ancestresses and ancestors about the best time and the best means by which to exterminate the whites and their offspring. They cannot control you if you only take direction from your own people. When you purify yourself physically, purify yourself spiritually, purify yourself behaviorally and so forth, then that begins to spread amongst your family, your community. We begin to purify ourselves, Ojida purification. Then we clearly recognize who we are, clearly recognize who the whites and their offspring are, the white Europeans, white Asians, white Americans, white, Amer- white Hindus, white pseudo-Native Americans, white Arabs, white Hispanics, and so forth, all of these non-black individuals who incarnate as spirits of disorder without exception. There is not one exception to that reality. Never has been, never will be until we make them extinct. When we recognize these spirits of disorder as our absolute enemies, simply cancerous cells within the great divine body of creation. They only deserve extermination, eradication. Not unity, but extermination. Just like cancerous cells within your body, your other cells do not seek to unite with them. They are isolated, they are exterminated, and they are expelled from the body. The whites and offspring cannot rule people, rule us, when we have that kind of mindset. And we don't seek to follow and enslave ourselves to their culture and their faith, religion and their perverse ideals. When we reject all of that and embrace ourselves, recognize who we are and recognize them as our absolute enemies, as well as their culture and pseudo-religion, they can't control that. So they sought to denigrate, just like they sought to denigrate the terms vodou, which actually means deity, divinity, god or goddess. They denigrated that term. Same thing with hoodoo, which deals with medicine. 
from plant life, mineral life, and so forth, sacred metal. They denigrated the term juju. They denigrate the term black. They denigrate anything dealing with our people to make us turn away from that. When they saw a surge in our people awakening and reconnecting with our ancestral culture, specifically with our ancient ancestral culture of Kanat and Kamet, so-called Nubian Egypt, the whites and the offspring moved forward, got into motion, and began to erode the support of that. They began to place coons in the community who would denigrate the term conscious, denigrate the term Afrocentric, denigrate the term African centered, denigrate the term Hatef, turn it into something very negative so the average black person who don't even know what these terms mean would never want to have anything to do with these terms. They would see them as ignorant, foolish, ridiculous, and so forth. They would create little characters in sitcoms and in movies, black nationalists, the pan-Africanist, the black power individual is always a crazy individual or a hypocritical individual or on the down low, they're deep down inside, they really want a white girl and all sorts of nonsense. The whites in their offspring plant these things in little black sitcoms, black movies, black uh, television shows, um, cartoons, music videos, everything else. The same is true with regard to the term hetep or hotep, as well as the term conscious. You have the whites in their offspring using their agents who are our enemies as well and who deserve to be eradicated, black agents in the community who deserve to be exterminated, those kind of Negroes, but then you have brainwashed, ignorant Negroes who deep down inside still worship the whites in their offspring and they promote, unconsciously, unwittingly promote that ignorance because they're consumed by self-hate. So it goes from in the 90s, people saying conscious is a term that's empowering, in the past few years, conscious being a negative term. People 20 years ago using the term hetep, or even 10 years ago using the term hetep as something empowering and intelligent, and people are drawn to the term, trying to find out what it means and so forth, to the past few years, and becoming a term that's used in a denigrating fashion. Hotep, nigga, hotep this, hotep that. And those who promote it and use it are in two classes. They are either ignorant, consumed with self-hatred, or they are agents within the community. It's one or the other. They are either ignorant or they are agents. And a great number of them are agents. And that's why they have become popular at using that terminology at the same time. The key is those who are ignorant because the agents need to be eradicated. They're the enemy just like the KKK. But those who are ignorant of the terminology, ignorant of the definition, we have given the proper definition for the first time of the origin of the term conscious, the etymology and cosmology of the term, as well as talking about the male deity, Hetep, or Hotep, which is a divinity, a force in creation that we invoke ritually who has been here as an aspect of creation, one of the Abosom, one of the Orish, one of the Vodou, one of the Arus, has always been here. Started off that process talking about the etymology and cosmology of the term. We talked about the day of the Hetep in part two. Tonight we're going to get into the female divinity, Hetepet. Hetep and Hetepet, or Hotep and Hotepet, male and female forces in creation operating within an aspect of the spirit realm. So first we're going to go back to that text. If you look at the, the image we use for the show, that is a priestess of the divinity Heteru, and that priestess's name is Hetepe. So she is named after the female divinity Hetepe. So anytime someone uses the term Hotep in a negative fashion, what they're doing is denigrating the name of a male deity as well as a female deity, a female goddess that's directly connected to all Akurakani, Akurakani people. It's a denigration of a force in creation, a divine force in creation. That's how idiotic it is to misrepresent the term. These Negroes who are agents, of course, have, do not have this knowledge. But those who are just ignorant, 
they do not have this knowledge, even though they promote themselves as professors, promote themselves as babas and eyes and elders and master teachers and grandmasters and sebas and all of this, and linguists and, and culturalists and spiritualists, all of these nonsensical types. In reality, as we've shown in parts one and two, none of them have ever given a proper definition of the term hetep for conscience. So they've been misinforming people, some of them, for decades. They've never been elders, never been eldresses, never been master teachers. They've been misinforming our people all along. So we need to stop listening to these individuals. Some people say one of our problems is we don't listen to each other enough. That's absolutely wrong. Our problem is we listen too much. We spend too much time listening to people instead of actually investigating. We sit around and listen to these clowns on YouTube, listen to these clowns doing all kinds of broadcasts and TV shows or documentaries or speeches or whatever it is, and we're following and listening and listening and listening. But we do not investigate. We do not vet the information that they put forth. We should never simply sit around listening to people. We listen too much. Stop listening and start investigating and prove. And when you actually do the investigation, you will see that these individuals never knew what they were talking about in the first place, and this is how the term could easily become denigrated, and then some people will begin to utilize the denigrated aspect of the term because they never understood the cosmology in the first place. So we're going to go over quickly to just recap this notion of Hetep. And we talked about conscious and so forth, and then we're going to get into Hetep. So, of course, the term conscious, the root con, meaning to come together, join together, at, by, near, drawn together, joining something together. That term in English, going back to the Proto-Indo-European root con, meaning the same thing. We showed that that comes from the term ka in ancient Kemet. Why does ka mean to join together, bring together, together, at, near, by, and so forth? Because we actually have the two arms reaching out, pulling things together, holding things together, the ka symbol. So the term ka literally means that. The ka is the soul of the divine consciousness. It is shown with the two shoulders and the two arms and the open hands reaching out, the ka is what draws in and holds the ba, the divine spirit, divine living energy, and the ka is the soul, the union of the spirit and the soul, the divine living energy, the spirit, the animating force within us, and then the conscious, the divine consciousness, knowledge within us. You unite your consciousness with the divine power, then you can begin to act. If someone has some quote-unquote consciousness or awareness, but they don't have any power, someone who is paraplegic, they are aware of what's going on in the room and what should happen and what needs to happen, but they do, they do not have the power to get up and act and make something happen. They have knowledge, but they have no power to move. Somebody else can be have the power of animation. They can move and act and so forth, but if they were blind and if they were also deaf, then their movements could be self-destructive because they can't see where they're going. They have no consciousness. They can't hear where they're going, so they cannot make proper judgment. You need to have consciousness to be able to see what your functioning creation is. The ka is the male term. ka es or ka is the female term. The ka or the ka not only means soul, the mind, consciousness is the divinity that dwells in the head region of Apurakani, Apurakani people only. A male deity if you're male, a female divinity if you're female. It's called Kra, in Krawa, in the Akan tradition, Ori, Inu, in the Yoruba tradition, St. Lido, in Vodun, Chi, in Ibo. is a divinity that's assigned to take up a residence in the spiritual head of the person, directed by the supreme being to take up a residence in our head region before we even incarnate in the world. We are ancestresses and ancestors ready to reincarnate and be drawn back into a womb. We go before Inyamewa, Inyamewa, Amen, and Amen. They direct a deity to take up residence in our head region. Once that divinity takes up residence in the spiritual head region, now we have a force in creation 
that would direct us as to our function and creation throughout the course of our lives and how we are to operate in harmony with order. That is that divinity of consciousness. It is called the ka, male, kaesh, or ka, female. It is shown, the symbolism, as we said, the two arms reaching up, holding the ka in place near the head region, but also pulling in the body, the divine living energy, physical and spiritual body of the person. That's why ka means to come together and so forth. The chus part or the skyas part, so the term conscious or conscious as it's written, or as well as the term conscience, the con we already talked about, the sense or chus or skyas comes from the term skyer in Latin meaning to know, and that root skyer meaning to know comes from the so-called Proto-Indo-European root sky, which means to divide, to separate. The whites and offspring do not know why sky means to divide or separate. As we have proven, the reason is because the term sky in ancient Kemet is a plow, which divides and separates and overturns the soil, creates division, separation, so when you make a split within the soil, then you can go beyond the surface and go down deep into the nutrient-rich soil, and that's where you plant your seeds. When you plant your seeds in that nutrient-rich soil after you sky or you plow or you separate, then you bury those seeds and they can reach down within the deep nutrient-rich earth, pull the minerals and so forth and nutrients from that, and the seeds begin to germinate and root and so forth and eventually sprout manifest. So when we plow in the field, we create sky, we use a plow sky, but we can plow sky, create a separation of the vision so we can get deep within the nutrient parts of the soil so we can plant our seeds, so we can sow those seeds and we can reap the benefits of that which is deep down within the earth, the nutrients within the earth. When we plant our seeds with regard to fair ground, when we engage in ritual prayer, the icon term for ritual prayer literally means to split or to cleave or to separate. We create a split or a cleaving, a separation, an incision within the spirit realm. And we open up a gateway. The ritual song, the sound vibration create a split, a remnant, a split or incision to open up a gateway to the spirit realm. Ritual song, ritual dance, ritual drumming, ritual possession and so forth, these things, these sound vibrations and movements create a split or cleaving, an incision is created, and now there's a gateway open to go back and forth between the spirit realm. We've created a split, a divide, and then we can reach down within the spirit realm, grab the nutrients, the power, the energy of the abosom and the insomanfo so that we can sow that energy and reap that energy and empower ourselves. This is where the term sky, meaning to plow, literally plowing within the field, but also plowing so that we can gain knowledge, so we can go beyond the surface, the topsoil, go deep down into the nutrient-rich soil, so we can grab what we need from the nutrient-rich soil so we can empower ourselves and grow and develop and fully flower. This is why sky, the proto-Indo-European term, means to split or divide, but they don't know why it means split or divide. And they say sky is the root of skyer, meaning in Latin meaning to know, and skyer becomes skyerus, and skyus, and con skyus, or conscious, or conscious, or conscience, or skyer also mean, being the root of sky, or science, or science, meaning to know, to gain knowledge, and so forth, but the root being sky, meaning to separate, or divide, or split. All they could come up with is, well, maybe Sky means to split or divide because these things will divide things and separate them, and then you examine them, and then you can gain some knowledge from dissecting or splitting things or dividing them. That's all they could come up with. They didn't understand that the term sky is not a proto-Indo-European term. It's actually a term from ancient Kermet, and there's a cosmology that gave birth to the term sky, plow, splitting, plowing, going, dealing with gaining knowledge. It's not about just separating, dividing, and examining. It's about plowing, sky, to plow, so that you can open up that nutrient-rich soil and go deep down within and grab the treasure within that soil. 
so you can empower yourself, strengthen yourself, grow, develop, and fully flower. Then we dealt with, so that's Ka, the soul, the divine consciousness, Kaya, and then Sky, which means to plow, literally. That's the origin of the term Khan and Sky, or Khan Kaya, the Khan Chaya, the conscious in English and in European language. But then we showed the cosmology that gave birth to the union of Ka and Ska. So when we look in the so-called Pert and Heru, the Rudnu Pert and Heru, chapter 110, the name of that chapter is, here begin the chapters of the Sehet, Hetepet, and the chapters of coming forth by day. And they're going into and coming out of the spirit realm, coming into the Sehet Aru. And then they talk about having power within the ancestral realm, the spirit realm, and becoming Akut, or Akutu, one of the spiritually cultivated ancestors is an ancestor. Akua, Akut, meaning a shining one, an illuminated one, one who has divine wisdom and intuition, whether they're an ancestral spirit or in the physical world, one who has achieved that level of spiritual cultivation so that they can see the Abosom, see the forces of nature, align their thoughts, intentions and actions with divine order every moment of every day because they're in alignment with the forces in creation. They're an illumined one or quote-unquote shining one and a wise one. The key here with this particular text, as we showed in um, both broadcasts, and let me, we're going to have to pull it right back up because it just went back out. Hold on one second. The key with that particular text that it shows the union in this particular chapter, 110, the beginnings of the field of Sekhet Hetep, the divine field of peace and offerings and so forth. The reason why that's key is because when you plow in the fields of Hetep, then you can become an Aku, you become an illumined one. We talked about how you become an illumined one by plowing in the fields of Hetep. And we're going to read that section real quick. Let me pull it right back up. Taking a minute. And as we pull that up, and as we said earlier, for those who are, if you're on the phone line, if you have any questions or comments, hit the number one. And if you're in the chat room, you must log in as a user in order to interact in the chat room. So let me make sure we yeah. system went out real quick. We had to pull it back up. We just want to make sure that everything is back up. We're going to pull the chat room back up. So if you can, okay, so the chat room is coming back up. If anybody has any issues, just uh, send us a note in the chat room. And then we'll we'll get that back together. The page went down real quick, so we had to pull it back up. We want to get to this chapter 110 in the Rudu Pert in Aru, and in this particular section, uh, chapter 110 is in the Papyrus of Nepsini, and you can get that on archive.org. All right. Okay, now it's coming back up. Okay. So the name of that chapter, the chapters of coming forth by day, chapters of the second chapter coming forth by day, coming in and out of the spirit realm, of being in Sekhet the mighty land, the Lady of Winds having power there, becoming an Aku, Aku there, of plowing there, of reaping there, of eating there, of drinking there, doing everything, even as a man or a woman does upon earth. And the critical pieces dealing with that, we don't have to read the entire text. It says, let me gain dominion within that field, that sakhet, for I know it and I have sailed among its lakes so that I may, might come into its city. My mouth is strong. 
Let me be rewarded within your field, O oh, you God, Hetep. That which you wish I will do, master of the wind. May I become an Aku or an Aku, a shining one, an illuminated one therein. May I eat therein, may, may I drink therein, may I plow therein, may I reap therein. And then there's a number of, of very extensive part of the text, and they continue to invoke the divinity itself. So when you plow in the field, you open up that split, you go into the nutrient-rich soil, you sow your seeds in that soil, they germinate, the roots go down deep within the soil and grab the nutrients within the soil, and then a sprouting takes place in the full flower. So when you plow, eventually you can sow and reap and, and become fully developed. When you plow in the fields of the God Hetep, because you align yourself with that divinity, the God Hetep, then you align yourself with your Ka, your divine function. And when you align yourself with your Ka, you align your divine living energy, your, it's called the Ba'a Ba'at, with the Ka, because you're plowing within the field. The union of the Ba and the Ka is the union of the spirit and the soul, creates you as an Aku or an Aku, an illuminated being, one who is spiritually cultivated. Only when you plow in the fields of itself, that is in the after death state, when someone transitions to the ancestral realm to live amongst those spiritually cultivated ancestors as an ancestor, they invoke the divinity itself so they can operate in the ancestral realm in a harmonious fashion and become an honored ancestor or ancestress in the spirit realm. But the same thing happens on earth. When we plow in the fields of Hetep, when we invoke the god Hetep, we invoke the goddess Hetepet, the divine fields of peace and offerings and so forth, just like when you plow within a field and you send those down and the roots go down, there's fiery energy within the soil. The energy of Ra and Ra'et is animating and making the soil vibrant. So when the roots go deep down within the soil, they also pull on that solar energy that's moving within the soil. That's why they show Ra in the form of Akura in his night boat sailing in the underworld in the 12 hours of the night, that divine fiery energy moving within the quote-unquote underworld, enlivening, empowering, making vital the underworld, and so forth. When we go deep within the physical world, when we... When we plow and so forth, we go deeper than the soil to grab that vital energy. When we go in spiritually in the spirit realm and go deep within the spirit realm, we attach and connect and invoke the energy of our Ba, our Ba as the divine living energy within us. That's a little portion of the energy of Ra and Ra within us, the creator and creatress within us. When we sow within and provoke that energy within us, once that energy is awakened, that fiery energy is awakened, that divine living energy is awakened because we've been sowing within the field through ritual, and that energy connects with our ka, the divine consciousness that's seated in our head, seated in our spirit's brain. The divine living energy connects with the energy within the brain, just like the oxygen within your blood flowing through your circulatory system. It flows up and connects with the cells within your brain, and there's a, a connection there. Of course, if you cut off the blood flow to the brain, then there's, it's over. But when that blood is flowing freely and optimally, then you're operating at a, at a high capacity. When the divine living energy moves through your spirit body is circulating, and you connect it with the cause of divine consciousness. Now you have power, divine living energy, and consciousness, the ka, connected with the ba. And when the ba and the ka unite, then you become an Aku, an Aku, a living, shining, illuminated being. That takes place when you go to the field of the God Hetep and the God Hetep. So you plow in that field, the term for plow is sky. You go sky within the field of the Hetep and you unite with your Ka. Ka, sky. Ka, sky, kan, chaya, conscious, and so forth is directly related to the God Hetep. When you go to the God in Tep's field, you sky or plow within his field, you unite your Ba with your Ka within that field, and then you become an Aku and a Lumen one, which means you become aware, fully aware, intuitive, and so forth, 
you become, quote, unquote, conscious in the real sense. Consciousness is directly related to the God Tete. You cannot have Kaskai or Kaskaya to Kanchaya to consciousness without plowing sky within the fields of the Tet in order to connect with your Ka, the deity within your head region, or the Kaya, the female divinity in the head region, the female. So we went into detail about that. We talked about the God Hete in the previous um, second broadcast. Now we deal with the goddess Hetepet, and of course she's the female force animating the divine fields of peace and offerings and so forth. That is the ancestral realm, the spirit realm, which continuously impacts the physical realm. There's no separation from the spirit realm and the physical realm. We operate in both realms continuously. Every time you engage in thoughts and so forth, you're in the spirit realm. Your physical body is operant, still engaging in the immaterial realm, a certain aspect of the immaterial realm. There are different divisions of the spirit realm. It's like there are different divisions of the physical realm. It's like you can have different neighborhoods and places where you can go and you can't go. There are different regions of the spirit realm where the nananom insumafo, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors reside in the spirit realm. We make our transition. This is where we are naturally drawn to if we live in harmony with order. If we were not living in harmony with order, we were engaged in disorder perpetually, then we're repelled from those who live in harmony with order. It's no different than two magnets with the same polarity facing. They will repel one another. If you consistently dwell in disorder, you make yourself repulsive to the forces of divine order, which are the deity, the supreme being. You also make yourself repulsive to those human beings who lived in harmony with order, which are our people only, so you cannot dwell with the insama. Just like if someone is acting fool, criminal, and so forth, and they tried to come up in your house, and there was 20 relatives in your house, fool would not be able to get in the house. They would be repelled, even if they need to get beat down or taken out, but they're not getting up in the house. They're not allowed, because they're not bringing that kind of criminality or perversity into the house. The same happens in the spirit realm. And, of course, all of the whites in our screen, they have no connection to the realm of the spiritually cultivated ancestors and ancestors. So they're just earthbound, criminal little spirits hanging around like homeless entities until it's time for them to reincarnate through their blood circle and so forth. So this is what we're dealing with. Hetep and Hetepet, the male and female expensive and attractive force that animate the divine field of peace and offering. The region of the spirit realm, when you see Ra moving through his night boat, and Ahura and Ra'et as well, Ura'et moving through the underworld, they bring that divine living energy that enlivens the spirit world and powers the spirit world. They bring the Ba and the Ba'at. And then, of course, when we sow in, in the, those fields, we, we reap that energy. Now, we want to go to the pyramid text real quick. You can look in the pyramid text of Pepi the first, as well as Mer and Ra, as well as um, Pepi the second, and so forth. But we're just going to go to a specific section. If you look in those pyramid decks, you will find the name of the female divinity, Hetepet, in that particular text. You'll also find it in the uh, Book of Opening the Mouth, which we're going to get into. You'll also find it in the um, hours of the duat and so forth, we're just going to read a section here. So they're talking about the king, Pepe, who made his transition, and how he, once he made his transition, because he lived in harmony with the divinity, uh, he was identifying with their functions in creation because he was living in harmony with them while he was alive, and now he's going to be accepted by them in the spirit realm so he can live in a harmony in the spirit realm. So it says, this Pepe sets forth with you, Heru, and sets forth with you, Tohutu. Bear him on the tip of your wing. Behold, it is Seker at the head of the Ma'at boat. This is the boat that carries the um, person who made their transition across the river, which divides the physical world and the spirit realm, governed by the god Ma'at we talked about. We talked about the judgment of the god Ma'at, which takes place after the judgment of the goddess Ma'at. If you're found um, 
righteous by the God Ma'al, that he will ferry you across the river to the place in the spirit realm so you can operate in harmony with the spiritually cultivated ancestors as an ancestor. So this is what they're talking about here. Kepi sets forth with you, Teru. Kepi sets forth with you, Jehutu. Bear him on the tip of your wing. Behold, it is Seker at the head of the Ma'at boat. He who passes, passes with his ka. So when he passes through and crosses that river, he's passing with his ka. That means he was living in harmony with the deity that dwelled in his head region. If you don't live in harmony with that deity that's pulling your head region throughout the course of your life, it's always directing you towards things that you should be engaged in. If you go against it and you say something in my head told me to go in a different direction than I didn't and you create uh, self-destructive activity within your life, you're rejecting your own ka or kaya. Here they're saying Pepe, he lived in harmony with his ka, so he passed with his ka, passed over the river. He passed with his ka. And Kenti Mepti passed with his ka, and this Pepe passes with his ka to the spirit realm, to the heavenly realm. He has taken the ladder, and he has ascended the ladder, and his name is Akertet, the one who aligns with the sky. And we talked about the ladder. You cross the river, climb a mountain on that divine ladder, and you go up into the spirit realm and so forth. So we have that divine ladder in the Akan tradition, the divine ladder in ancient Kemet. When you make your transition, spirit separates from the body. You go to the ferryman, you cross that river, you climb a ladder, go onto the divine mountain, and then you climb a ladder up into the spirit realm and so forth. That's the symbolic. So he climbed the ladder because he passed with his cock. He was able to climb that divine ladder up into the heavenly region, and then he sails in his boat to the scepters of the imperishable star. The bull of heaven and climbs his horn and makes him to pass on his way to the lake of death. Hell takes Pepe, you shall not fall to the earth. This Pepe is grasped with two sycamore trees which are in the midst of that side of the sky. He sails on and they place him in that eastern side of the heavenly realm. Know you your name, be not ignorant of your name. So this is key. Your name is An Cher S and Uruwa, and I kind of be Uwura. Uwura is the name of your father, and the mother who bore you is Hetepe. So when he passes into the realm of the sky because he made that judgment, he passed the judgment of the god Ma'al, he passed it with his ka, he had Tehudi and Heru to carry him on the tip of his wing, up of their wing, and carry him to the other side. He passed the judgment. He was adjudicated to have lived in harmony with divine order. Therefore, he was able to ascend that ladder and get up into the sky and go past the imperishable stars and all of that to get to the ancestral realm. The name of his father, Oura, the name of the mother who bore him, is the goddess Hetepet. And then they say, if anyone repulses the offspring of Ancheref in the horizon, you will repulse Pepe when he comes to the place where you are. If you repulse the offspring of Serket, you repulse Pepe. And what they're saying is the only way you can repulse Pepe if you can repulse one of these deities, then you can repulse Pepe. If you can repulse this other goddess, then you can repulse Pepe. What they're really saying is since you can never repulse a deity, you can never repulse Pepe from the purified region of the ancestral realm because he has proven that he lived in harmony with divine order. So just like you can't repulse a deity, you can't repulse that. You can't repulse Serket, the goddess Serket, the scorpion goddess, and you can't repulse that. You can't repulse Ancheref, you can't repulse that. And they go through a number of different um, divinities in that section. So the key is his father's name is Uura, the divinity Uura, which means the great one. His mother's name is Hetepet. When he comes into the field of Hetep, the god Hetep, he also comes into the field and under the domain of the goddess Hetepet. So what does she do once he gets into that region? 
So we're going to pull this text right back up. It had uh, the page had fallen or had shut down, so I'll pull it back up. So let me do that real quick. And this is a short text from the book of the opening of the mouth. We're not going to go through that whole thing. So they're talking about ritual purification using uh, the sa Soro, which is the term for incense. Sa Soro means to make Soro, to make divine. So when we burn incense, it's called sa Soro. That's a descriptive title of incense, meaning to make divine. When you burn that incense, one of the, the reasons it makes divine is because, for example, when you see the bobbers, it's spelled with the image of a bird, sometimes a human-headed bird, the head of the individual, and then there's a bowl of burning incense. That bowl of burning incense is that divine fire, energy of Ra and Raya. Ra and Raya are the creator and creatress. There's a divine living energy animating all created entities. They are grandchildren of Amen and Amenet, forces in creation that create and are directed by Amen and Amenet to create the universe and so forth. That divine living energy that they Carry is the Ba and the Baya. Ra and Raya, the creature and creatress, are the great divine spirit in creation. So instead of saying great divine spirit, saying Ra is the great divine spirit and Raya is the great divine spirit that the great divine spirit energy. Instead of saying great divine spirit energy or great divine living energy, we say Ra is the great Ba in creation. Raya is the great Bayat in creation. The Ba and Bayat are the male and female expressions of the divine living energy, the divine spirit in creation. It's moving through all created entities, naturally created entities. That's Ra and Raya, and it is manifesting we burn that entity. So, they're sensing, insensing the divinity for purification in the book of opening the mouth. And we'll get partway into the text. It says, and to watch it, the lady of the great house, which is in the house of plants. And to segment the theft, watch it, in the city of Pe Unanis, and Menhi, and Nut Shesi, and Hetor, which is a number of different divinities, and to Resenit, and Mehenit, and the Shinta, the lady of Kepset, and, and the goddess your purification are the purification of the ma'as crown. The ma'as crown being bound on you, heaven shining or shines brightly. Your purification are the purification of the kabu. The kabu being bound on you, heaven shines brightly. Saru purifies you and sets senses you or instances you, purified. Purified are you, O oh God, deities, male divinities. Sense or instance are you, O oh goddesses, intoru, female divinity. You have obtained your fluid of life through or heka, sekmet, through nesert, the goddess nesert. You have purified and gained your fluid of life through the goddess Hetepi. Offerings shall be to every god and every god, and their hands shall be filled with the love of Osar, and there shall be offerings and a happy faith to, to the Osar, and he shall be happy on this day. When they say to the Osar, in this particular text, they were talking about uh, Seti. When he made a transition, he identifies with Osar, he's becoming Osar Seti. Offerings to be made to every male divinity, Ntoro. Offerings to be made to every female divinity, and their Ntoro. And their hands shall be filled with the love of him, the Osar, Osar Seti. And there shall be offerings and a happy faith to the Osar Seti, and he shall be happy on this day. Because he went through purification, he was sent or incensed or purified with the purifying fire, first through Ur Hekal, Sekhmet. Nesert, and then the goddess Hetepi. Once he went through that purification with them, 
then he becomes identified with the Osar, he's purified and they say makes makes a happy face and to the Osar and he shall be happy or purified or balanced at peace in this death. And he goes through the field of Hetep and invokes the God Hetep and says, What you wish I shall do. He goes and becomes purified by the goddess Hetepi, using that burning incense, that fire energy of Ra and Rayat, the Sekhet Hetep, the divine field of peace, offerings and so forth, the Sekhet Hetep, both titles, the spirit realm, the ancestral realm, the quote-unquote underworld, the realm where Afura moves through his boat and that sun boat of the night, the quote-unquote night sun moving through the underworld, that fire energy moving through the underworld, enlivening and empowering what is in the underworld or the spirit world. No different than if you take a deep breath and the fiery energy outside that's within the air gets inside your body and begins to move through your system, move through your cells, the oxygen and the fire, empowering your cells and so forth. You're bringing the fire inside of your body and it's moving and circulating through the quote-unquote underworld to empower it. The spirit of Ron Ryan penetrates earth, enlivens earth. The spirit of Ra and Riot penetrates the ancestral realm. They enliven and empower and illuminate those who are in the ancestral realm who are living in harmony with divine order. And because those who are living in the Sekhet Hetep, the Sekhet Hetep is the divine field of peace, and they live in harmony with the God Hetep and the God Hetep. And when Ra moves through the divine field, the Hetep and Hetep that's governed by the God Hetep and the God Hetep, he moves through that divine field, his power and the power of Riot. It enlivens and illuminates that field. When you capture energy, just like you can capture energy in a shrine, you can capture energy, for example, in a laser, and then you decide to, you know, use that laser to project that energy to someone performing um, eye surgery and removing cataracts and so forth. You capture that energy in the instrument, and then you utilize it to your benefit at some point. From the energy of Ra and Riot, from the sun set, from the energy that's penetrating the sun sets and moves through the quote unquote underworld, and now they become Afura and Afuraya, and they're moving through the underworld and bringing power and light and energy to the underworld and the spirit to animate and operate within the underworld. That energy moves through the underworld and then it comes to the eastern horizon and begins to rise up as the sun once again in the sky that sells across the sky for 12 hours of the day. Then the sun sets, that solar boat sets, and then they get in the night boat and sail in the underworld for the 12 hours of the night, and that cycle keeps going. When that energy of Ra and Ra is moving through the underworld and it moves through the Sekhet Hetep, the god Hetep and the goddess Hetep, they have the capacity to take some of that solar energy, that divine living energy of Ra and Ra, that Ba energy, that Ba energy, and hold it within their divine field. Even when the boat continues to move away and sail away and go back to the eastern horizon and rise up in the sky, changing boats and rise up in the sky, Hetep and Hetep can contain and capture and conceal some of that divine living energy. That's why their fields are the fields of all and they have the divine food within their divine field because they remain firm. They can capture the energy of Ra and Riot and hold it and utilize it to fertilize that divine field. And the ancestresses and ancestors who go to Hetep and Hetep is the divine field, the ancestral realm, where the spiritually cultivated ancestors and ancestors are, they live in that divine field because they're empowered. They live in harmony with Ron Riot and the forces in creation when they were on earth, so they can go to that realm of the Hetep, the Ket Hetep, the Ket Hetep. They can dwell in that field. They can take advantage of the energy that's circulating within that field. They can plow in that field and overturn the quote unquote soil, meaning engage in ritual practice, engage in ritual prayer, invocation, create an incision and draw that divine living energy of Ron Riot from. The God Hetep and Hetep, who holds that energy just like you hold energy in a shrine. In a shrine. So we go to a shrine and invoke the divinity to release that energy. No different than when you set fire to a stick of incense and then, you know, the smoke releases and it fills up the entire room. You release the energy. Hetep and Hetep 
They capture the energy of Ra and Raya. They capture the divine living energy. They capture the Ba. They capture the Baya. They capture that energy and hold it in their divine field. And those of us who sow in those fields, we provoke that Ba and Baya energy. And it stimulates the Ba within us and the Ba within us. And we connect that stimulated energy with our Ka. And we unite our Ba and our Ka. And we unite our Ba and our Ka, our spirit and our soul. We become an Aku or an Aku, an illumined being. We become aware and conscious. But that Ka, Ka, conscious, that happens in the field of Hetep and Hetep, the divine field of peace and offerings and so forth. Just as the text says, it's an entire cosmological foundation for moving through the divine field after you have been adjudicated by Ma'at and Ma'at that have been living in harmony with divine order, you can cross that river into the ancestral realm. You invoke the divinities. They place you in that field. You can sow in that field. You can draw from that divine energy. You can empower yourself. You can realign yourself with your car, your soul, your divine consciousness, and you become an illumined being. You do that in the spirit realm after death, and you become an illumined ancestor or ancestress. The only reason you can do that after death is because you were doing that throughout the course of your life. You were invoking the God Hetep throughout the course of your life at your shrine, pouring libation, invoking Hetep. You were invoking the God Hetep throughout the course of your life at your shrine, during ritual and so forth, aligning with them. You were invoking, of course, your own body, your own personal power. You were aligning with the deity in your head region. Whenever that pull in your head region was directing you to certain thoughts, intentions, actions, behaviors, activities, you would align yourself with that. If you made honest mistakes, then you engage in ritual practice to realign your thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order. So you consistently did that throughout the course of your life. When you needed to correct yourself, then you went into ritual. You went to the shrine. You began your invocations. Those sound vibrations created a split, a cleaving, an incision, a gateway opened into the spirit realm. And you entered into that gateway, and the Abosom came, and the Usamapo came. The deities and ancestral spirits come through that gateway, and there's an exchange of energy and communication. You created that split. You move into the ancestral realm, and you began to plow through ritual practice, sound vibrations, ritual song, ritual dance, ritual prayer, creating a sky or a separation or a splitting so you can sow within the fields of Hetep. You invoke the god Hetep. You invoke the god of Hetep. When you invoke them, they release that energy of the ba and ba to stimulate your own ba, and now you can align your ba with your ka. You can align your divine living energy with your ka. And once that connection clicks, then you begin to radiate as an aku or an aku, a shining, illumined one. And that takes place in the field of a tep and a tep. So there's no separation between ka, the soul, ka et, the soul, the divine consciousness, sky, to plow, plowing within the field of the tep and the tep, so you can release the energy of Ba, connect with your kind, Kai, so you can become an Aku. This is why it's all in the same set. How to become an Aku, an Aku, an illumined one within the field of Hetep and Hetep. Who knew about the God Hetep and Hetep? Of course, the term Hetep. And our time is Chete, Achete, and Chikamet. Hete became Chete, and our time is still pronounced that way, meaning gift and offering. And then Achete, 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 is the name of the divinity, and we're going to get into that divinity in another broadcast, same divinity as an ancient Kemet, and so forth. But even just studying, and of course, that same divinity exists in every tradition Yoruba, Vodun, Igbo. Everybody has their own names for these different divinities. Some of them have the exact same names in Asia Kemet. Sometimes, sometimes they use the descriptive titles, that, and you will find those in the names of, of deities in Kemet as well. So it's not just the Akan, but every Akurakani, Akurakani group, all of these deities we're talking about, all the different groups have them, including those of us who are in North America, the Hudu and Juju and Vodun and Grigri and so forth, and the color tradition, Manga, all the different things, all the different traditions. These deities exist because they're forces in nature. 
the aspect of creation. So we've always invoked that. So who knew about the god Hetep? Who knew about the goddess Hetepe? They've always been a been here. They've always been around. This is not new information. If it's not new information, why is it you must ask it's the first time you're hearing about it, even though people have been talking about this teaching, the culture of Kemet for the past 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25, 30, 40 years. Why is this most critical aspect of the tradition not being taught? It's the same as when we did our three-part series on the god Ma'a, the male divinity who's the counterpart of Ma, and how you must go through the judgment of the weighing of the heart against the feather on the scales of Ma'at in the hall, who sets Ma'at, the dual hall of Ma'at. And once you go through that judgment process, through those 42 assessors of Ma'at, those 42 deities, not just 42 laws, but invoking 42 deities, and you're adjudicated to have balanced your heart with the feather, then you must go through that judgment process within God, Ma'at. And he takes you through a series of questions and proof to show and search your spirit to make sure that you align yourself with the utmost on the divinity throughout the course of your life. And when you pass that test, then you can be buried across the river and taken to the second test. And that's where this text picks up when Pepe is talking about he connected with Heru and Tehuti, and they carry him across the river, and he passes with his cop. When he passes with his car and climbs that ladder and gets into the heavenly realm and so forth, his father is Uura, his mother is the goddess Hetep. All of these texts are connected. The book of the opening of the mouth, the Runu Perkin, the so called Book of the Dead, the, the pyramid text, and so forth, all of these things have to do with what takes place after death, but also what happens throughout the course of our lives. Our people didn't know what the term conscious meant, they didn't know there was a direct relationship to conscious. And Hotep, or Hotep, the goddess, the goddess Hotep, or Hetep, the god Hotep, or Hetep, directly related to the Ka and the Kaya and the sky, the plow. We have to reassess what we've been, quote unquote, taught. As we said earlier, it's not that we don't listen to each other enough. We do too much listening, but we don't do enough investigation. We need to stop doing all of this listening and following these individuals who've been standing around, running their mouths for the past 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years, who really have no knowledge of the culture of cosmology. Many of them were infected with Christianity, Islam, and so forth, and they really didn't want to let that go. So they bring these idiotic notions of monotheism, trying to force that onto the culture of ancient Kemet. They bring idiotic notions of pseudo metaphysics and try to force that on the culture of ancient Kemet. They bring idiotic notions of atheism and trying to force that idiocy on ancient Kemet. Pure stupidity. Trying to force evolution and all kinds of stupidity on the culture of ancient Kemet. Because they have no knowledge whatsoever. Whether they call themselves priests or priestesses, babas or eyas, nanas. They bars, none of that matters. Pseudo linguists, pseudo culturalists, PhDs, all of that is absolutely irrelevant. And it is proven by the fact that deities who are central to every aspect of our lives the God Ma'a, the Um Toro Ma'a, one half of the law that undergirds all of creation. If you've never heard any of these individuals mention Ma'a, then what else have they not mentioned? What else do they not know? Typically, they don't talk about Ra'at, they don't talk about Aminet, and of course, they do not talk about the god Hetep or the goddess Hetepi. They've never dealt with it. We need to stop listening. We need to start investigating. We need to stop listening. We need to start investigating by going directly to our shrine, to the Uncombre, of the deities that incarnated with you, those who are assigned to you pre-incarnation the quote-unquote masters or master teachers, Mr. so forth, 
are your nananom usamafo, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors of your direct blood cells, who have assigned to you to guide you as someone of that specific clan to operate in the world in a specific fashion. Those masters of energy and power and consciousness are the abosom, the deities that govern your kra, your krawa, your soul, your divine consciousness, and the matric clan and patric clan divinities who are assigned to your ancestral blood circle. Those are the ones who are, quote, unquote, masters. That's where you get all your confirmation from. If things that are being taught does not comport with what your own nanano and samampo, your spiritually cultivated ancestors and ancestors, show you and what, with what the Abosom, the Orisha the Vodou, who are connected to your blood circle, assigned to you pre-incarnation, who have been with you throughout the course of your life, with what they show you, with what other people are saying does not comport with that, then you reject what these individuals are saying, and you go with your own people and your own Abosom. If we weren't just simply listening all of the time, we wouldn't be holding these individuals up as teachers. We wouldn't be having a misguided sense of reverence or quote-unquote respect for these individuals who really have no knowledge. Only because we listen to what they said and how they labeled themselves and how other people who were ignorant of reality upheld those labels, this is the, and we listen to that, that's the only reason we put these individuals in these different categories. Some of them are misinforming our people deliberately, and they're agents. But the vast majority are misinforming our people unwittingly because they were never properly informed themselves. But they allowed themselves to become mislabeled as elders, elderesses, spiritual teachers, priests, priestesses, and so forth. Nobody was vetting any of those titles. They weren't looking for some criteria as to how did you become this elder, elderist, priest, priestess, high priest, queen, mother, king, and everything else. By what means did you achieve that? We're simply listening to what people say, and then we go along. Because we've been groomed to listen to the pastor, listen to the preacher, listen to the cracker and so forth, and not investigate for ourselves. As though it's blasphemous so to speak, to investigate what these individuals are saying or is disrespectful to investigate and question everything that they're saying. But you should be questioning everything that comes out of the mouth of anybody. You don't accept anything. The masters, mistresses, the nananom and so forth, your nananom, your spiritually cultivated elders and elderses of your direct blood circle, your nananom and samafa, your spiritually cultivated elders and elderses who are ancestresses and ancestors now, those are the ones who we go to. Those are the ones who we deal with. Now, that information in this three-part series is all going to be part of an upcoming publication. This is that the three-part series we did on the God and Ma'al it's going to be part of an upcoming publication, one of our books. We just wanted to get this information out, get this information circulating, not so people can simply listen to it, because people even have that, fall into that habit with regard to our broadcast, as well as our book. They will fall into that habit of simply listening to some broadcasts and listening to some videos and so forth, reading some of the material primarily listening to the different broadcasts, and then they don't go and investigate. If they do go investigate what we're talking about, of course they're going to find and be able to verify everything that we're talking about is actually. But some people still fall into this notion of just listening. And then they ask questions about certain things or they start debating with other people just because they listen to something we said. And then they email us and say, well, what did you say about this thing? Well, the key is you can listen, but you need to investigate. If you investigate, you won't have these different questions. You're not just going by what we said and try to memorize what we said in the broadcast. You'll go to the actual source text. In all of our books, we show the source text of everything we're talking about or the ritual practices that we're talking about or how to engage in these processes so you can gather this information yourself. We always give that, that pathway. So it's not just about listening to us either. 
You can listen, but you need to investigate. You need to stop listening to so many people and investigate everything that we embrace. You shouldn't embrace anything unless it's been investigated. Unless your own cop, your kayak, your own insulin folks, the both don't connect to your blood circle, where they sanction it, then you can embrace because it's been vetted. And they will direct you to vet it and seek confirmation and gather confirmation yourself as well. But this information will be uh, published. We just wanted to get this information out so that people can have this information. Of course, uh, recently there's been a, a little bit more nonsense than normal in the blogosphere, in the realm of YouTube and uh, Facebook and so forth with regard to what is conscious, what is accept. But we needed to put this information out for the very first time for people to have an actual understanding of the etymology and cosmology of the term conscious as well as the term hetep, which is rooted in the god hetep and the goddess hetepet and plowing within the field of hetep and hetepet so that we can align with our ka and become our ku, our ku, illumined ones, and that's how you become, quote, unquote, kan cha or kan ska, plowing in the field of hetep and hetep. Okay. So I'm going to get on the uh, – we have a couple of questions on the phone line. If you have any questions or comments, hit the number one. And we're also – we started a little bit late because we had uh, some technical issues with um, trying to connect with, with uh, blog talk. It wasn't working properly at first, and we had to shut everything down and come back out. So it took a few minutes to get back on, so we're running a little bit behind. So – Okay, if you have on the phone line, number 2843, you had a question or a comment? Oh, I'm just What's listening. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, what we're going to do, we want to mention, for those who uh, missed the broadcast last week, this coming March 12th is our second annual Epsitai Ancestral Religious Reversion Conference, Apurakani, Apurakani African Ancestral Religious Reversion. Epsitai, the term Epsi means back, sign means return. Epsitai means return back, reversion. When we deal with ancestral religion, we don't deal with conversion. Conversion means to transform somebody into something. We're not transforming somebody into something. You have to convert somebody when it's something that you're trying to promote. It's actually unnatural for them, and you have to try to convert them or transform them into something. A Christian, a Muslim, a so-called Hebrew, or Nuwabian, or Rastafarian, or Hindu, or whatever, misinformed, more, and all sorts of nonsense, you have to convert somebody into something conversion. We deal with etchisai, reversion, returning back to our original pristine state, returning back to our es- sankofa, returning, going, and grasping from our ancestral past, from that past we made with Nyamewa Nyame pre-incarnation regarding what our function in creation is, what cell in the great divine body we are to be, and that we move forward and execute that function. So we're dealing with etchy sign, ancestral religious reversion. We will have our all-day event. It's a conference, second annual. It was a great turnout last year. We have three annual conferences, the Hudu Mind, Hudu Nation Festival in October, which we had our second annual festival back on October 16th. Um, we have the etchy sign event in March, and then we have the Ujira Mind, Afashe, the nationism, Amarie nationism, the purification of nationalism, conference dealing with nation building in June. But Etchi Sign, this is our second annual conference. It's an all day event, of course, it's free. All of our events are free. We have monthly events in Washington, D.C. The presentations, the workshops, trainings are always free. We are open to offer our kind of kind of people only. We also give away a free copy of one of our books to everyone who attends our events. We've given away over 1,200 copies of our, the free copies of our soft cover books 
um, in our various events. And, of course, the e-book versions of our books, 24 books, are free downloads permanently on our website. So we do publish our books um, in soft cover. We publish ourselves, print ourselves on our own printers in-house in color. But then we also have the e-book version, which are free downloads. Etchy Sign and Such for Religious Reversion, March 12th, which is a Sunday from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. here in Washington, D.C. We're going to have vendors all day. Uh, we have about three vending spaces left, so if you would like to vend, go to the Etchy Sign page on our website, download the vendor registration application. Um, we'll have vendors throughout the course of the day. We're going to have presentations dealing with different expressions of ancestral religious practices born of our blood circles right here in North America. We will be speaking on Kudu, the Akan ancestral religion, and reclamation of that in North America. We'll have our sister voodoo queen, Kalinda Laveau, out of New Orleans, will be speaking on voodoo and the reclamation of phone, ebe, and ancestral religion in North America and so forth. We're going to have a couple of other presenters as well, which we will confirm and put that information out. So we're going to have presentations throughout the course of the day. Vendors throughout the course of the day, of course. It's a family event, of course. It's a great event and it's a great time. So we'll be putting that information out. If you would like, even if you would not like to vend, if you would like to promote your business, organization, or institution, we are publishing the second volume of our Etchy Sign Ancestral Religious Reversion Journal. It will be released on the day of the event. Of course, it will be released on the website as well. The soft cover versions will be available and the ebook version. But a free copy of the soft cover version will be given away to everybody who comes to the conference. Um, and then, of course, it will be on sale on the website from that point on. The ebook version will be a free download. And the ebook version, of course, as a free download, if you have your business organization or institution um, advertised in the journal, then hundreds of thousands of our people will see it. We've had 3.2 million hits on our website over the past 12 months. And a, a lot of that has to do with our free book um, that people download by the thousands every month. So if you would like to place an ad in, in our journal, the 8.5 by 11 journal, um, one quarter page, and it's full color. One quarter page is $25. A half page is $35. And a full page, which is, of course, is full color, all of them are full color, is $50 for a full page. And it's an 8.5 by 11 size journal, magazine size journal. So that's a large page. So one quarter page, $25. Half page, $35. Full page, $50. You can go to the Etchy Sign page on our website if you would like to either vend or if you would like to place an ad for your business, your organization, or your institution in our journal, and that way you'll be able to get, you know, your information out to the community. Tap into the networks that we are connected with and the people around the country and around the world who download our books and listen to our broadcasts and so forth. So um, we need those JPEG files in as soon as possible so we can begin the formatting. So simply go to the Etchy Sign page. You'll see the link. You'll see the rates and everything, and you can make the payment there if you want to vend. You can download the vendor registration application right there. If you would like to attend the conference, as we said, it's free. Open to Akurakani, Akurakani people only. Um, you can go to our event notification page on Facebook. We have an Etchy Sign page specifically set aside on Facebook. We also have an Etchy Sign event notification. And then we also have our Ojidamai social media network, which is separate from Facebook and Instagram and so forth. We have our own social media network that we pay for separately, a uh, private network. You can join that. That is the way to actually register for the conference. Registration is free. It's required. You simply go to the ojidamai.spruce.com uh, link. And we'll put that link in the chat room real quick. ojidamind.spruce.com and ojidamind.spruz.com ojidamind.spruce.com That is our social media network. You can sign up for that. It's very similar to Facebook. You can create a profile. We post blogs and 
articles and videos and discussions and images, and it's very similar to Facebook except it's uh, privately owned. So the event notification and that, when you click and say you're going to attend, that is your registration for the event. You can also go to the Facebook event notification and please share the Facebook event notification as well. But if you would like to advertise your business or if you would just like to take out an ad in our journal in support of what we're doing, we appreciate that as well. Um, if you would like to purchase books, that will assist us with the cost for the free event. We still have that sale going. We didn't take the, the sale button down. We have the entire 23 book set for $100, which includes shipping. It's $91 with $9 shipping. So when you go to our publication page, our entire 23 book set, and we will add the 24 books in there because that's going to be published very soon, within the next week or so. So it's really, even though it says 23, it's going to be 24 books. The entire 23 book set with the extra 24th book for $100, that is on our publications page. That we, we left that sale up because we need to generate those funds to cover expenses, including two major things on one hand to assist uh, with travel expenses for the out of town presenters who will pre be presenting at this conference for the fourth spring, and also for the free book giveaway because we're giving away free soft cover book to everyone who comes out, and that's an expensive um, endeavor. But we want to keep that going because we've been doing that at every event, and we've given away over 